Hello, Buckeye Nation. When I was searching for the words to sum up my feelings after that Rutgers game, I found Terry Wellman's tweet. Definitely a weird feeling game. I know y'all feel it too. I thought that encapsulated the game perfectly. That may have been the weirdest game ever. From start to finish, there were some really bizarre things that happened in that game. Let's break it apart after the intro. <laughs> Welcome to Buckeye Football Fangirl. If this is your first time here, my name is Lisa and I'm the gal behind this channel. Thanks again for tuning in and for the gift of your time. I deeply appreciate you. I've been having so much fun interacting with everyone on Twitter during the games and I've loved all the new Ohio State friends that I've had a chance to meet. One of my favorite things is getting to hear your stories about how you became a fan. If you haven't shared your story with me yet, go ahead, drop it in the comments below and tell me how did you become an Ohio State fan? All right, let's shift gears a bit and talk about that game from last Saturday. What a weird, weird game. To be honest, the first punt of the game should have made us realize that we were in for a strange ride. I'm going to blame it on the wind, but that muffed punt did indeed set the tone for the rest of the game. The entire first quarter felt like the team was slogging through mud just to get a few scores on the board. There was a moment in the second quarter where it felt like the O might be getting back on track with their quick scores, but then came the drive that wouldn't end. Yes, it went on and on, my friends. Heather's tweet summed up this succinctly. It took us like 17 minutes to score from inside the five, longest drive in the history of football. And Seabus Buck echoed the sentiment with this tweet. Q, how did you spend your Saturday? A, most of the day was spent watching the Buckeyes trying to punch it in from the one yard line. I lost track of how many plays it actually took to get the ball into the end zone, but it felt like it lasted for ages. Between the timeouts called on each side, penalties committed by Rutgers to extend the drive, not that I'm complaining, and the funky play calling, it was one weird way to end the half. And then the weirdness followed the Buckeyes into the second half as well. While the game was never in question, no, not even when Rutgers was up seven to zero in the first quarter. This was definitely not the same offense that we saw last week against Wisconsin. Throw in not one, but two illegal touching penalties on receivers and the fact that the ball couldn't seem to stay in the hands of some of the most talented wide receivers. And you've got one wacky game, but that's not even all. Then you have the fake punt by Jesse Mirko and that was truly the cherry on top of the Sunday. Now, of course, the Buckeyes didn't need to fake that punt, but you have to realize no coach told him to do it. That was just a football player taking advantage of a football opportunity. How is he so supposed to know that Crookshank would be so ticked off he'd bowl him over with a late hit and send sparks flying with a mini brawl and a pointing and shouting match between Day and Shiano? Well, we all know that's what happened now. And quite honestly, we learned something very important about our head coach that left many people echoing what Emily tweeted. I will follow Ryan Day into battle. No questions asked. We also got to see the brotherhood in action. As Tara tweeted, nice to see the entire team immediately came to Mirko's defense. Brotherhood is stronger this year than last. This team is special, and despite the past game not quite hitting their stride like we expected them to, it's awesome to see the other units step up and ensure a Buckeye victory in the midst of all the other weirdness. Now, let's talk about what was not weird for a moment, Mayan Williams. Mayan Williams was not weird during that game, no. He was phenomenal. As Mr. Kite Surfer tweeted, Mayan Williams is in beast mode. You could say that Mayan Williams owned the end zone. You could also say as Land Grant Holy Land tweeted, I think Mayan is running as if he is as annoyed by these bad punt catches, penalties, bad CB play, Aaron Judge cut-ins, and dumb reviews as we are. Mayan always runs angry, and that's why we love him so much. Tying the rushing touchdown record with five TDs was everything good 
that we needed to see on Saturday. You can tell he's worked his tail off and it was so much fun watching him run people over on his way to writing history. One other non-weird thing that happened on Saturday was that Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg had themselves a game. As Who Knows Ty tweeted, I know the whole punt fake run thing kind of become the talk of the day, but man did my guy Steel Chambers have a day. Him and Tommy Eichenberg are really settled in to being the top dogs at LB and their play is definitely showing it. Thank goodness they both came ready to play. As as the top two tacklers on the team, they have been making stops and ending plays. Chambers, in particular, was electric on Saturday. As Buckeye Stop tweeted, Steel Chambers is the man of the hour, currently at 11 tackles and now an interception. Eichenberg was responsible for nine tackles during the game and has been on a tackling streak ever since that Rose Bowl game to close out last season. As Sam Block pointed out on Twitter, Tommy Eichenberg is a freak. 59 tackles in his last six games. I know I'm singling out Chambers and Eichenberg in this show, but to be honest, the whole entire defense gets props because they have been killing it so far this year. It takes the entire D to shut down opponents together, and they have been doing that. And this past week vaulted the defense into where Ryan Day said that he wanted to see them during the offseason. That's right, friends. We have ourselves a top 10 defense. Now I get it. There's still a lot of the season left. However, this is what we have all been clamoring for for the past two years, and it feels just as good as we thought it would. As long as the players stay humble and hungry, I think the rest of the season is going to be massively fun. All right, let's shift our focus to the game that we have coming up this Saturday. This Saturday, the Ohio State Buckeyes take on the Michigan State Spartans. Ohio State and Michigan State have met 50 times in the past. Out of those times, Ohio State's won 35 times, and Michigan State has won 15 times. Michigan State is currently two and three, having won their first first two games against Western Michigan and Akron and lost the past three games against Washington, Minnesota, and Maryland. The team is led by head coach Mel Tucker, who walked into the new head coaching job February 2020, right before the pandemic hit. He's originally from Cleveland, Ohio, played college ball at Wisconsin, and his Big Ten roots run deep. He got his first college coaching job at Michigan State University in 1997 underneath Nick Saban, and he's commented how good it feels to be back where his roots are. He also has a history with Ohio State. Starting in 2001, he became the defensive backs coach for our beloved Ohio State University Buckeyes. He was part of the coaching staff when we won the national championship in 2002 and was promoted to co-defensive coordinator in 2004 before jumping into the NFL. He's a bit of a tech nerd and is an avid bird watcher during his free time. Taking a look at the quarterback position, Peyton Thorne has been leading the helm as the starting quarterback this year. He comes from a football family with a grandfather who is a Hall of Fame coach and a dad who is a head football coach at North Central College. Michigan State University has always been one of his top five dream schools, and he's truly been living out his childhood dream being the starting quarterback there. He's mostly a pocket passer, though he has scrambled on occasion this year for about 45 yards. As a starter last year as well, he made a big splash in the record books when he broke the school's record for single season passing touchdowns and threw for the third highest passing yards in a single season. Fans have been hopeful that this year would be the year that they see him lead Michigan State to the next level. However, things have been a little shaky so far. While he gives his all for his team when he's on the field, he is guilty of trying to force plays that are just not there, which has led him to throwing six interceptions so far this year. He also hasn't always been able to escape when the pressure was brought, leading him to being sacked six times. There's been some rumors floating around that Thorne is still dealing with some lingering effects from a shoulder injury, which is affecting his play. And while I don't think we'll see him on the field, the backup quarterback, Noah Kim, has some Michigan State fans buzzing because of the flash that he has shown them in the few games that he's had a chance to play. Again, I don't think we'll see him in the game, but 
Store that away as something that's just good to know. So far this year, Thorne's most targeted wide receiver has been Keon Coleman. Coleman has just over 300 yards for the season. He was thrust somewhat into the spot during the Washington game as Thorne's likely more preferred target was out of the game due to injury. That preferred target was Jaden Reed. Reed has quite a history with quarterback Peyton Thorne. They actually played youth and high school football together and have been a dynamic duo on the field for the past nine years. Reed started his play at Western Michigan and transferred to Michigan State University after earning freshman All-American honors. He's a fast receiver who is used to outrunning his competition on the field and the trust and chemistry that he's built with Thorne over all these years has been an asset to their team. While he suffered a minor back injury that caused him to miss their Washington game, Reed has been back since then and will definitely be someone the Buckeye defense will need to keep their eye on. When it comes to running the ball, Jalen Berger has been leading the team thus far with just over 300 yards himself. Jarek Brossard has been part of the running back rotation. However, both backs have been struggling in the past three games. The offensive line play has not been great so far this year and neither has the Michigan State defense. On defense, the Spartans have been plagued by injuries. Cornerback Kendall Brooks leads the team with 47 total tackles and three forced fumbles. He's one of the players that Tucker snagged out of the transfer portal and jumped at the chance to play at Michigan State. He has a history of working hard at his family's commercial logging business, and he grew up surrounded by 10 siblings. Did I mention earlier that one of Mel Tucker's catchphrases for this year is keep chopping? So last week, we took down Shiano and his chop mantra. This week sounds like the perfect week to take down yet another college football program focused on the chop. Anywho, I brought all that up to say that the chopping catchphrase really resonated with Brooks as he joined the MSU fold. Another disruptive player has been linebacker Jacoby Winman. He's logged five and a half sacks and five forced fumbles. That was not intentional. These Michigan State Spartans are looking to pull themselves out of their losing game slump on Saturday. So you can bet that they will be giving this game their all. Not to mention our favorite team hits the road for the first time this weekend. Playing in a hostile environment for the first time of the season will be a new challenge for these Buckeyes. And I don't think that we should just write Michigan State off completely. As Dan tweeted, I know Michigan State has been struggling lately, but we still got to take this game seriously. Always first road games of the season can be tricky. Okay, we've come to the part of the show where I want to know what you think of this game coming up. Do you think Michigan State is going to rally and show Ohio State a good fight on Saturday? Or do you feel that they will walk away with another loss on their resume? If you think Ohio State wins this one easy, please like this video and drop me a comment below. If you're not so sure or a little nervous about this game, let me know about that too in the comment section below. While I definitely don't think that we should write MSU off, I do think that there are a lot of things that seem to be leaning in Ohio State's favor for this game. The first being that it is interesting to note that in their three losses, opponents have had explosive offenses who have averaged 500 yards total with 300 plus of those yards coming through passing. Now, this is just my personal opinion, but that sounds like the perfect recipe for Ohio State's offense to feast. But again, that's just me. Another thing leads me to think that RD is going to have themselves a game too, because while Michigan State's run game was explosive in the first two games of the season, as it should have been against Western Michigan and Akron, it started struggling when the competition ramped up. In the past three games, it never really was able to get started which played a role in those losses. If our run D shows up just as dominant as we've seen them be so far, I think they'll be able to replicate those same conditions, helping Ohio State secure the win. I can't wait for the first road test of Ohio State's season this Saturday. I have a feeling it's gonna be a good one. And with that, I'll see you on the other side of the game. Oh, eight.